Hello and welcome to Replay Value. Occasionally I do this thing on my channel called the Analysis Blitz, where the community submits topics, I randomly draw one, and try to make a video on said topic in a set amount of time. 5 hours and 24 hours being the two that I've opted for. If you've seen my weird bunny girl movie video, or my analysis on a silent voice, you probably know what I'm talking about, and even when I get assigned material I haven't seen before, like Monogatari or Girls Last Tour, I think I've been able to turn around a pretty solid video in the allotted time. At least usually. Even if I wanted to keep going with the series and watching, I sat myself down and forced myself to get the Blitz project out before continuing with the show. So it was weird watching my 24 hours tick away and saying to myself, eh, one more episode couldn't hurt while watching the first season of Chihaya Furu, to the moment where I said to myself I'd rather finish the season and figure something out later than attempt to make a video in the remaining time. So much for my worthless pride in this challenge, I guess. Chihaya Furu is good. I think that goes without saying because I wouldn't have taken an extra two weeks to watch the whole first season if I didn't enjoy it. And I knew it was going to be good as soon as episode four came around because of how much I enjoyed Chihaya Furu's story structure in making the payoff of episode four hit in the way that it did. But to break down why I think that moment is effective, we're gonna have to talk about how we start stories. What the opening seven minutes of the first episode do to empower the flashback that follows the next two and a half episodes, why the length of that flashback kicks ass, and the usual meat and potatoes of what quote-unquote standard openings do to grab the viewer. Generally speaking, when we talk about what beginnings need to accomplish, we're talking about three main pillars. When I say beginnings, I'm using it vaguely intentionally, since what constitutes the beginning is different depending on the medium. The first act of a play is a different length of time than the first episode of a TV series, and God knows that chapter one of any given book can be any number of words, so apply to any given medium at your leisure. And in regard to those pillars, I want to be clear that these are breakable guidelines. Skilled storytellers play on our expectations for these elements and subvert them to create memorable and surprising beginnings all the time. But if we're going with a safe start, here's what generally needs to be hit. First, people want to know what they're consuming, so the introduction of the premise is a must. Grand Blue hits you with both aspects of its premise, diving and drinking antics for comedy in the first minute and 30 seconds, and then spends the rest of the time emphasizing its style of humor so you know what you're getting into. The Promise Neverland doesn't hit you with its premise until the end of the episode, but that delay helps to inform the audience about the thriller nature of the storyline, which teaches us about its tonal style. Totally different ways of introducing the story, both effective in doing so. Second, a character to connect to. This one is pretty self-explanatory. The focal character of the opening doesn't have to be the main character, or even relevant after the immediate start, as long as they're able to introduce us to basic material like the setting, we're in good shape. And third, narrative questions. The most obvious one is what happens next, but it's also the simplest one that applies to every story, so some other intriguing aspect that empowers that question like what happened in this character's past that made them like this, what is the history of this world, where is this person that's been alluded to, and all of the whys. I use the term narrative questions instead of plot questions because sometimes these hooks can also be in the production side. What's up with this use of water in the visual language? When does this leitmotif play in the score, etc, etc. There are more, or rather the list of general things to include in the beginning of a story can be even more specific than the three I outlined here, but for the purpose of this discussion and without getting too far into the weeds, this will do. It's important to note that these points are a combination of structure and content, what has been included and where slash how it was included. And that structure in particular plays a huge role in the way that we understand the content we're being fed. If that doesn't make sense right now, give me a second. We'll get there. So with all of that in mind, how does the opening episode of Jihaya Furu fare? Or even better, how do the first seven minutes fare before we launch into that flashback I was talking about earlier? Well, we get introduced to the premise basically immediately. This is a story about Chihaya and Karuta, since the first thing we hear is the game's opening poem, and from the moment we see Chihaya, we never leave her side, nor miss out on her talking about and thinking about Karuta. Her introduction is a bunch of guys fawning over her, and then being confused by the fact that she's putting up posters for a Karuta club in both a skirt and track pants. She bemoans the fact that no one is interested in Karuta, leaving her success in track and her friends on that team behind despite that lack of interest. She's isolated with Karata and thinking about her desire for teammates for the entire opening, at least until we meet Taichi, a friend from her past who she's able to talk about Karata with, if only briefly, and who introduces hints of romance from the fact that he's dating someone, a surprise to Chihaya, and his obvious interest in her though she's blissfully unaware. 
From a production level, the omnipresence of the Sakura Blossoms helped transition between settings with ease, and it's a generally good-looking show to boot. So, in the broad strokes, we've met our main character and learned about her personality, have learned her goal to have a Karuta team in the high school, and have the premise, competitive club show with some light romance elements. But what about those hooks I was talking about? The narrative questions. That's where this opening section excels in my opinion, because the two major questions that it sets up, why is Chihaya interested in Karuta, and who is this guy Arata that keeps getting brought up, are going to be answered in the flashback that is about to follow for the majority of this episode and the two following ones. There are a lot of elements introduced in this opening that lack context. There are lingering questions that beg to be answered, like why does Taichi react that way to Arata's name, that receive heightened importance when they do get answered because we know these things still matter in the present. Which brings us to the rest of the first episode, set up in match cut fashion with the presence of the train connecting us from present to past and launching us into 2.5 episodes of flashback. A good rule of thumb for writing is that you don't waste time on stuff that doesn't matter in the long run. So it's telling that Chihaya Furu devotes so much of its time to these characters past in the form of this flashback. It makes up the majority of the first episode, and the entirety of the two that follow it, and while I appreciate what the opening seven minutes do to empower the flashback by setting up those questions to be answered in the past, and introducing the premise of course, the content of the flashback itself is really important to keep the viewer locked in. And it does this by focusing on characters, and specifically character motivations. It not only serves as our introduction to Arata, and to gain perspective on Taichi's character, it's also where we learn about why Chihaya loves Karuta, and the evolution of her time with it. Not to over-recap what happens in these episodes, but we basically see Chihaya introduced as a girl whose dream in life is for her sister to become a superstar, and then who discovers her own passion after being introduced to Karuta through the transfer student who recently joined her class in Arata. After accidentally ratting out that he was the paperboy despite being an elementary school student, further isolating him from the class that's been teasing him for his accent, of which Taichi is no small part, Chihaya befriends Arata and they play Karuta together, where he is a total monster at the game. He tells her his dream is to become the Meijin of Karuta, the best player in Japan and thus the world, which gets the ball rolling on Chihaya figuring out her own passion. He's the inciting incident in Chihaya's life. That's where we wrap up the first episode, and we see the rivalry between Taichi and Arata develop as a result of that in the following ones. With Taichi's rationale for his bratty and later underhanded methods being threefold from parental pressure to interest in Chihaya and a general enjoyment of the status quo of which Arata is an outsider and Chihaya's interest in Arata being especially damaging. We see the trio's relationships develop, the depth of Arata's love for Karuta, why Arata is so important to Chihaya, why Taichi's relationship with Arata isn't a cut and dry positive one even after they compete together, and then the question that's been hanging over so much of this flashback, what happened to them, is revealed as to why the trio were forced to go their separate ways, which builds to the really beautiful and foreshadowed moment of them in Arata's apartment where Chihaya says if they keep playing Karuta, they'll see each other again. It's easy to understand in that moment why Chihaya was upset about Taichi not planning on playing in high school, and why she asks if Arata has also found something to replace Karuta with. It's no accident that the scene that launches us into the flashback features that vignette, and the same way we launched into the flashback with foreshadowing, so too do we end it. The promise that Chihaya makes with Arata about seeing each other again once they both reach class A, bringing us back to the present day where Chihaya is playing in a tournament that will allow her to promote to that very rank. That transition back to the present makes clear the emotional stakes, further compounded when Chihaya makes Taichi promise to make a Karuta club with her if she wins, and then the re-emphasized clarity of how Chihaya's only connection to Arata at this point is their shared past, and presumptive mutual love of Karuta, as she's unwilling to call him despite being the person she most wants to talk to. Episode 4's lack of Arata on a physical level echoes throughout the episode, though his presence is felt continuously, not only for the previous point about the phone call, but also in Taichi's own comparison of his Karuta ability with Arata's as the reason he doesn't play anymore in a discussion outside the hall when the matches are being played. Not to mention Chihaya mentioning Arata's name as she launches into her counterattack in the final match. That match itself is very well directed in my opinion, still using this as an opportunity to teach the audience aspects of the game while using close-up shots and maximizing the camera motion to build tension up until the final moments. The release of that tension after Chiaya wins and becomes Class A is maximized by soft lighting, some more Sakura petals, and just the general happiness of both Chihaya and Taichi in that moment. With that tone established firmly in the audience's mind, Chihaya calls Arata for the first time. She kept her promise, and there's a shared anticipation 
confrontation between both character and audience. We get to see the grown-up Arata for the first time. What's he been doing off-screen for three years? Chihai has been waiting for this moment for so long. And then... The lighting and music tell you everything you need to know in terms of that tonal contrast, but after three episodes of watching that young boy talk, play, and live Karuta, to be greeted with that? Not to mention how Chihaya had a sad reaction to Taichi no longer playing, someone who wasn't nearly as obsessed with it as Arata was. You can just feel the betrayal and the confusion emanating from your screen at that moment. And if that moment doesn't have you asking the question, what on earth happened to this guy that made him say those words to give up on his dream of being the master, I cannot possibly relate. Because you know damn well I watched the next episode with bated breath. And from that moment on, I was sold. Because Chihaya Furu had got me on its premise, its execution on hooks, and most importantly, its characters. Before we wrap this video up, I want to jump back really fast to talk about the structure of the first episode again. I feel like whenever I talk about writing structure, there's a strong so what or no duh response. Like of course it was structured the way it was, how else would you structure it to be so effective as those stories come out of the ether fully laid out? Which they're not, we're just seeing the end result and usually there was some thought put behind it, but I think you'd be surprised if you had that no duh response, and hopefully this will still be interesting to you if not, that the manga for Chihaya Furu starts in the flashback. While the first few panels are Chihaya playing in presumably the Queen match, it provides basically no context, so when we're dropped into the past, all we know is that there's a kid riding his bike in the rain where he drops off a newspaper at a young girl's house. We only know this event matters because of the panel spread, but we don't know why it matters or have anything to grab onto at this point. In the anime, not only have we already met Arata, albeit briefly, but we know that this person is important to both Taichi and Chihaya in the future, so seeing it laid out like this builds the anticipation for those later moments when they're all together. There are a bunch of other small adaptational changes to the order of events there too, pacing them out a bit more to make it feel like not everything is happening all in one day, and I'm not saying that the manga's ordering is worse. I actually like how the chapter comes full circle by introducing the goal of Chihaya becoming queen in the final panel. But I also like the anime's ordering because it's designed around giving you hints into the future so that you know what you should be looking for in the past. Based on just the first chapter of the manga, I would have assumed that Taichi was an antagonist at best and a temp character at worst. And there's zero sense of dramatic irony in that we know these moments are fleeting. These are all trade-offs, because that lack of dramatic irony, the unification of perspective, empowers the moment where Chihaya realizes that this is not permanent and all of their reactions to the last time they play together. It's not that those opening seven minutes were anime original, they were stolen in part from chapter seven, but I think that the way the anime is structured does a better job of introducing us to the premise of the series, sets up the emotional through line for the flashback and the events of episode four in a more powerful way by getting us from the flashback to the moment faster, and introducing narrative questions by the way of dramatic irony. The two versions of this story's beginning are a great example of how structure informs the content we consume. And that's that. The only thing I didn't really get a chance to talk about is that the main theme, which is a beautiful track, probably plays twice an episode on average, and if you watch this series, it will be stuck in your head forever. Now, if you'll excuse me, the fact that Karuta got an anime has me excited to start writing my Settlers of Catan sports anime treatment and wait for Netflix to give me a call.